when we think about church life and we think about, you know, who we are and what we have been looking at, if you've been with us, if you've been watching, if you're a guest online, if you're a guest, you know, here with us this morning, we have, over the past few weeks, we've been going uh, through Luke, the eighth chapter, with some of the incredible, uh, you know, miracles of Jesus, I'm afraid sometimes. We get so used to reading, we get so used to looking at that we never take in, uh, you know, the power. We never take in the real situations that we see going on in Jesus' life and what is, that it was great, guys. It's perfect now. It's perfect now. Man, man, hadn't you did a great job on the song there? Two promises, man. Did it, come on. Didn't he do a great job? Man, did a great job on that. Uh, but we, we, we sometimes we overlook. I, I'm afraid we get, we get so used to, the, to, to what is going on, even when we're reading the Bible. We know we do that in life. We get so used to life. We get so used to what's going on in life that we get caught up into, uh, you know, not paying attention, not really looking at things. Now, throughout this, and I know this is a broken record, but I really don't think that you can go in the New Testament, you can't go into the Gospels and you start reading about Jesus Christ. There are some themes that continually just keep coming up at us, themes that keep hitting us. And especially, you know, in 2020, some of these themes just have to keep coming back. They've got to keep hitting us. They've got to keep waking us up. So we we have talked about, and we see it again today, there is a lot of fear in people's lives. Not just in, you know, uh, 2020, obviously around, you know, 30 AD, 32 and 33 AD, there was a lot of fear in people's lives. I mean, they didn't know what today was going to bring for them today. They were not, uh, the, the Israelites, we, we sometimes forget, they were not a free people. They were slaves to Rome, so they had no idea, and we know in studying history later on, all of this comes to a head, all of this blows up, uh, you know, there in Jerusalem later on, uh, a few years after Jesus is gone, so there is always this constant feeling of fear in their lives. Now, along with this constant feeling of fear, they're, they're faced as we are, and we see this morning we're definitely going to see not just fear, but we're going to see, you know, desperation. And once again, you go, gosh, Robin, you preach about that every week. That's because so often we're looking at people's lives within the New Testament. We see people coming to Jesus. We see what's going on. I mean, these disciples that are around Jesus, you know, what we can figure is maybe a day or two before, uh, or, or, or as they are coming back to Capernaum, as now they're landing back there, back to a place where there are docks, back to a port type of area, these disciples are, are, are wrung out. I mean, they've gone through a storm where they, they said they were going to die. They, they out, right out admitted that. They wake Jesus up. Remember, wake him up. Don't you care? We're going to die. So they believe they're going to die, which I think is funny. I mean, I do not because I, I, I would probably be in the same situation, but we have to realize that they asked the question, we're all going to die, meaning you're going to die too. That that's how you think, oh, that's how the Messiah is going to die. Oh, in a shipwreck. Okay, that's, that was it. No. And, and so that's why Jesus is so calm because Jesus knows this is not how it's going, guys. Just trust me. Oh, remember those words. Just trust me. Don't you have faith? Just trust me. Then they land there in the Gerizines. They, 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 you know, I can imagine them. Jesus, it says, Luke says, Jesus just, you know, he steps out of the boat. We get this idea, Jesus steps out, and then here they come. You know, the demon-possessed men, they come running and falling down before Jesus. And I tried to, you know, in my imagination, describe that. I can just see the disciples now. Once again, they don't say it this time, but once again, they have to have in their minds and their hearts, we're going to die. We're going to die. These guys are going to kill us. And so they're hopping back in the boat, desperate thinking they're going to die. And now what we're going to read today, they come back to Capernaum. They come back to Capernaum. But I want us to think a little bit about that desperation because what we're going to see this morning, we're going to see two people filled with desperation. Two people that, that really, they are at the end of the rope. You've been there. You know. You've come to the very end of what is going on. You believe this is it. Whatever it is, to each one of us, to each family, to each person, it could be something totally different. But we've been to the end of the rope. We've been to where we think there's no going on. There is no more hope for me. And what fills us at that point in time is desperation. Total desperation. You don't live life very long. You don't experience life very long that you realize you're there. This is it. I'm desperate. I don't see any hope. I don't see any way out. Well, we're going to see two people that, that are that, that, that face that. And I know we face that. I know a lot of us are facing that. 
You can't help but talk to brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ and Jesus today. Do you realize there are many of us right now that are watching there are many of us that have come into the room. There will be many of us at the next service that we're walking in here. And our lives, I know, are filled with desperation. And I want you to know that if that's where you're at today, please don't be ashamed of that. You see, we, we've come to believe that because the Bible, there, there are good Christians, and I've said it too, you know, hey, don't, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. The reality of it is, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm trying to remind all of us, encourage all of us, this is the Word of God, this is the promise of God, don't you trust me? I'm never going to admit to you that I've never been desperate in my life. I've been desperate in my life. I've stood next to the bed. I've watched loved ones, my own, pass away. I've been desperate. I've been there. I've wondered, what will tomorrow bring? What's the next hour going to bring? You see, I'm desperate. And we're desperate. What are we, what are we going to do tomorrow? What, what, what does all this mean? The phone call from the doctor with the test, what does it mean? The the loss of a loved one, the loss of family, the loss within our lives, the job that is gone. What, what's going to happen tomorrow with the job? My friends, I know as we watch, I know as we come in here together, as we you know, kind of look around and sense within the room, there are many of us that I know today are filled with desperation. And we come to this story, I hope this morning, that each and every one of us will realize desperation, we may not be able to escape it, but we can see how Jesus Christ gives us the answer to cope with it and to overcome it and to believe and have those words just as Jesus said, don't you trust me. So if you have your Bibles, Luke the 8th chapter, to grab your phone, to grab the Bible out, Luke the 8th chapter, we're going to start in verse 40. This morning, the two, the two other stories, the calming of the sea the casting out of the demons, uh, you know, the, the multiple legion, anywhere from three to 6,000. Jesus not fearful. Jesus not hiding in the boat. These demons confessing who he is because they were there at creation and they saw Jesus Christ as what God used to create this world. They are the ones that are in fear. And now today, a dad, his daughter, and a daughter of God. In verse 40, on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus. And I think Luke is just kind of telling us, you remember, just look up a few verses before that, the crowd there asked Jesus to leave. They were fearful of him. They were filled. So they asked Jesus to leave. Now Jesus comes back to Capernaum and the, this crowd, they're there to welcome Jesus because, because they had been waiting for him. No, I don't know you know, we, if, if we put this on a timeline, I mean, it was just a, yesterday or the day before yesterday that Jesus' disciples get in a boat, and he says, let's go to the other side of the lake. So you can see this anticipation of people that are desperate for God, but they know that Jesus Christ is going to come back. They're looking forward to the time he's going to come back to Capernaum. They're banking on it. They're hoping for it. They're praying for it. Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, they welcome him. Then in verse 41, then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue. That's just so important for us to have in our mind, in our imagination. Just again, if you go back to the fourth chapter, Jesus has gone to the synagogue. There in the fourth chapter, and Jesus is casting out demons. Jesus is healing people. Jesus is doing all the, This guy knows Jesus. He knows his reputation. He's seen because there in that fourth chapter, they end up, everybody is amazed. They're in wonder and awe of the, remember these words, power and authority that Jesus has. That, that'll come into play next week. Well, the leader of the local synagogue came, and get this, we've seen this all three times now. He fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, and the only daughter, the only, is the same word used in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his what? Only son. Luke writes, this is his only daughter. Who was about 12 years old, remember that, and she's dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. This word for surrounded means they were pressed right up against them. 
They were almost, these crowds are pressing in so tightly. If you've ever been in, in one of those situations, and I, I know a lot of you today, I mean, uh, you know, are the Chiefs playing football today? Oh, really? I, I thought they were playing Denver. I don't think that's playing football. <laughs> okay. Hey, Austin Weiss, how you doing, buddy? Okay. Where was I? I quit preaching there for a second. I'm sorry. I got into, got into meddling. I uh, shouldn't do that. She was 12 years old. She's dying. As Jesus went with him, they're talking about this crowd. They're surrounded by this crowd. Here we have a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Oh, everyone denied it. Everyone denied it. They're all like junior high kids when you walk in there. Who did that? Well, not me. Not me. Nope, nope. Not me. Not me. Well, there was somebody touching him. And that's what Peter says. Master, the whole crowd is pressing up and touching you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. For I felt the healing power go out from me. And when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble. She fell to her knees. There, there it is again. In front of him, the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. She gives her testimony, but, but Jesus isn't done. Listen to this word, daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. That's, that's important. Go in peace. While he was speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and he told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use in troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. And she'll be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except for Peter, James, and John, and the little girl's father and mother. The, the house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd, look at this, laughed out loud because they all knew she was dead. Then Jesus going into this room, took her by the hand, and said in a loud voice, I would imagine loud enough that everybody in the other room could hear, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus said to them, give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Oh, my friends, see, when, when, when you really, when we just... Start and we just read about what is going on here. The desperation, the fear, the anxiety in people's lives. When we see Jesus in the middle of this crowd, he's the, he's the hero. He's the celebrity. And everyone is gathered around. But still within that, what I want you to know this morning, I want you to know Jesus still cares. Jesus cares about people. He cares about you right now. He cares about whatever you're going through. He cares about the hurt and the desperation in your life. He cares that you may not know, what am I going to do this afternoon? What are we going to do tomorrow? What's going to happen with the job? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I want you to know that Jesus Christ cares. He's in tune with your life. He knows what's going on in your life, and he cares. He cares for us. And so there are, there are some personality traits I want us to see of Jesus really quick this morning. You've got them in your notes. Here's the first one. I want you to see his accessibility in verses 40 through 42. This crowd, when they have gathered back, as I said, the disciples are probably thinking, once the boat lands, they're thinking, man, I want to go home. I got to get, get a warm change of clothes. I got to dry out what we've got. I got to sit down. With I've got to decompress. I thought I was going to die within 12 hours. I'm going to die a couple of times. We've been kicked out of a country. Uh, I mean, oh, I gotta, we got to have some R&R here. And if it happens to be the chance that they're leaving where they have docked the boat and they're all trying to go home, suddenly there's a great crowd there. As I've already said, Jesus is their hero. He's their celebrity. 
You see, the difference in Jesus and what these people have been used to with their leaders of the Old Testament, if you looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and and the, the religious leaders of their time, they didn't want to be around the common people. They were too good for the common people. They accused Jesus. They asked his own disciples, why does your master, why does your teacher hang around with the the corrupt, the sinful, immoral people? And then they used the two worst things. Why does he hang around with prostitutes and tax collectors? Because he's accessible. Jesus is accessible. (laughs) Forget it. Jesus is open to each and every one of us. You see, it doesn't matter what you or I have done. It doesn't matter what addiction you are facing today. It doesn't matter what you are up against, the worry, the frustration. I know they're there. And I'm not just telling you, like, just, just go, I'm not scared anymore. No, Jesus wants to come to you. He wants to meet you in that desperation. He wants to meet you in that fear. He wants to meet you where you're hurting. He's accessible to us. And to this crowd, he's accessible and in the middle of all of that, we see these, these two contrasting souls that, that, that come together. And Jesus is open not to one, but he's open to both. You see, suddenly to Jairus, nothing is more important right now than Jesus. He doesn't care about what all the other synagogue leaders and the communities around are going to say about him. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if word gets down to, to Jerusalem and the Pharisees and the leaders down there that, that, that he's hanging around with Jesus. He doesn't care that all these people around him, you see, he would consider them defiled. He would consider them desperate. He would consider them sinful, outcast type of people. He doesn't care because he knows Jesus cares. He knows Jesus cares. I want you to know Jesus cares. He cares for you. Whatever you're facing right now, he cares. He wants the best for you. He's accessible to you. But not just is he accessible, but in verse 42, he's available. He's available. I want you to imagine, here's this great crowd, and somehow Jairus has found himself. He has gotten right up to Jesus I'm sure there was a couple of times he thought, oh, people are touching me, people are touching me. I know there's some of you like that. There are some people that are not huggers. And I love to run into you because I'm a hugger. I love to make Chris Comer feel just a little, you know, okay, I'll hug you. You know, I love that. I'm a hugger. And I get to see, oh, these people, that's three people back. I get to Jesus. I got to get to Jesus. I got to get to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, he falls down in front of Jesus. He takes the position of worship and humility. This synagogue leader, well known, well respected, the crowd must have gone, did he just trip or what? But he stays there in front of Jesus and he begs him to come to his house. My daughter is dying. Now, Matthew says she's already dead. So maybe if Luke is is saying that he's saying, please come to my house, my daughter's dying. Maybe Jesus even knows she's dead, but you care. you You haven't accepted that she's dead yet. So Jesus is available. Jesus goes, okay, let's go. I'll go with you. See, I want you to know that although your prayers right now, what you're praying over, maybe, maybe, yeah, boom, lightning didn't strike and everything changed and there's money in the envelope, in the mailbox. The doctor calls, oh, we made a mistake. You don't have this. All the, maybe that doesn't happen. But I want you to know Jesus is going, I'm right here. I'm right here with you. Let's go. Now, they get up. Jairus gets up. I just, Jesus, come on, get up. Let's go. Let's go. We got to get back there. And they start moving towards his house. What do you think Jesus talked about? What's your daughter's name? Oh, really? Oh, how old is she? She's 12. Oh, I love 12-year-olds. They're so fun. They're so excited. Man, they just, they just they dream of everything, don't they? Yeah. Oh, does she, is she in ballet? Does she do gymnastics? Does she play soccer? I'm going to have to heal her extra good. So let's, you know, and they're, they're moving. They're moving. You know, they're moving. And they had to talk about something. Because Jesus wants to hear your story. 
Jesus wants to know. He wants you and I to know that he knows. He's available. He's available to you today. He's available to us. (laughs) But then it happens. We see this part of his personality. Jesus' interruptibility. You can interrupt him. As they're making their way, it says in verse 42 there, as they're making their way, a woman in the crowd who suffered for 12 years. And I said, you know, I don't have an application. I just think it's very interesting. Made you think about it, didn't I? When that little girl was born 12 years ago, this lady started her journey of death. Why, why do I say it that way? Because you see, with this, uh, if you can look in Leviticus, the 15th chapter today, and you can start reading, I believe it's verse 24, somewhere around there, about, about women and bleeding issues and blood issues, you can begin to read about her life. Her life basically quit and died. She could no longer be around friends and family. Anybody that touched her was always unclean. Everything she touched was unclean. She was not allowed to go to the synagogue. She was not allowed to go out in public for 12 years. One little girl has been growing and experiencing life. One lady has died. One lady's life has been totally changed. And she's done everything she possibly can to make changes in her life, to find out what can she do. The doctors have done all that they possibly can. The priests have done all they possibly can. John MacArthur said this just on a couple of remedies, a couple of things that were done. One remedy consisted of drinking a goblet of wine containing a powder powder compound from rubber, alum, and garden uh, vegetables. Another treatment consisted of a dose of Parisian onions cooked in wine, administered with a summons, rise out of your flow of blood. Like that's going to make a difference. Other physicians described sudden shock or the carrying of ash in an ostrich egg in a certain cloth. But what we do know is she has spent all of her money. No cure, no hope. She's hopeless. And she does the same thing that Jairus does. She, though, has to work through the crowd in a disguise. You see, if someone were to see her, they would all realize they're unclean. All of a sudden, everybody would be pointing at her. All of a sudden, people would probably be grabbing her. Now we're unclean. Grab her. Get her out of here before she touches anybody else. So she's obviously somehow disguised herself. Somehow she's moved through this crowd. She's also pushing people out of the way. She's trying to get up close to Jesus. And Matthew says in her mind, the whole time she's saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch. To get to the hem of his garment, she would have to have instantly then, once she gets there, fall down behind him and grab the hem of his garment. It says she touched. Luke says she touched. But the word for touch, that we translate touch, means she grabbed it. Around the robe of Jesus, any Jewish man, there would be four tassels representing holiness of their life. I would have to imagine, if I could just grab that one. She is on her knees and she grabs the tassel. And instantly the word says, instantly her hopelessness was gone. Instantly she knew it. Instantly Jesus knew it. Something had changed. Instantly her life has changed. Instantly she's healed. Instantly the doors have opened up for her. Instantly. And here's what I want you to see about Jesus. He could have kept walking and he could have gone, Dad, Father, Dad, somebody just got healed, didn't they? He could have stopped. He could have looked back and seen this lady on the ground. She could have looked up at him. He could have simply said, gotcha. But if he would have done that, she would have still been socially dead. She would have still not been allowed to go to the synagogue. People still would have believed that that she was unclean. And so Jesus, not just in his interruptibility, it's in his exhaustibility that Jesus points out this lady to the crowd. Verse 45 through 48, who touched me? Well, everybody denied it. Everybody's afraid. And Peter said, Master, the whole crowd's pressing up against you. No, no, somebody deliberately touched me. 
For I have felt healing power go out for me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble. She fell at her knees in front of him again, and the whole crowd heard her story. See, my friends, maybe Jesus is waiting for us this morning to share the story. Maybe he's waiting this morning for us to share how desperate we are, how at the end of the rope we are, how we are hopeless without Jesus moving in our lives. Maybe he's waiting for the story. He didn't wait with her, but you see, there was more to her story. People needed to hear that she was healed. People needed to know, and Jesus wanted the story shared. In a few moments, he's going to say, don't share the story. But here he goes, share the story. Because of the next words that he says, daughter, it's the only time Jesus calls a woman daughter. Daughter, your faith, your faith has made you well. The word made you well. Your faith has saved you. Remember I said last week, When the people came out, they saw the man that had been demon-possessed, and they realized that he was well. He had been saved. The same word, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Jesus wanted the testimony, but he wanted it from someone that had been touched by Jesus, someone that was desperate, someone that was lost, someone that had no hope to be able to say, my hope has been found in Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, Jesus is waiting for your story of desperation so that he can share through that story the hope of eternal salvation. Not only that, but we see his faithfulness, verses 49 through 50. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the house of Jairus and the leader of the synagogue, and he told him, your daughter is dead. But Jesus is faithful. There is no use troubling the teacher anymore. <laughs> Don't you just kind of laugh at that? The messenger lost faith. The messenger had given up. But I think that all this time, Jesus is looking at Jairus and and looking at the lady, listening to the story, and Jairus is going, come on, come on. We got to go. You've been there. Come on, we got to go. I got to get, we got to get over here. I need you. Oh, was he so wrapped up also in listening? And the realization, there's hope. You see, her story said to all of us that are desperate, there's hope. There's hope. Maybe Jairus is thinking there's hope. And when the messenger comes to say there is no hope, it is Jesus that looks right at him and said, don't be afraid. And I said it this way last week, just trust me. Just trust me. My friends, Jesus is faithful, and I know right now you may feel like he is nowhere to be found. We're crying out for God, Jesus, where are you? But I want you to know Jesus is there to be found. He's there, and he's waiting. He's going to work in our lives, and it may take years, and and there may be many mountains and valleys that we go through, but Jesus is wanting us to join in in his faithfulness, to wait for his story to be told in us, and to be able to take every day the opportunity of our desperation to have it turned into the hope of Jesus Christ. Jesus only, Jesus alone is all that can help us. And Jesus is faithful. Not only is Jesus faithful, but then Jesus has a perspective in verses 51 through 52. His perspective, when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go with, in with him. Except for Peter, James, and John, the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people. Now, you understand that once she died, the, the Jews did not embalm They didn't embalm. And so once she died, everything had to be start. They started the preparations of what they were going to do with her. They were going to wrap her just like Jesus was wrapped. There was going to be spices. They were going to do all these things to her. Outside the house, the news has come. Jairus' daughter is, uh, is dying. So there are probably people waiting on the outside of the house. They're waiting for the doors to open. They're waiting just like, you know, I know all of us on Friday, we go to our football games. People are there early. People are there to, you know, they want to get in once the gates are open. Wherever we're at, we're going to rush in. We want to get my seat. 
And that's what it would have looked like. Because not only were the family and the friends of Jairus that were there to mourn, there are professional mourners. They have just the right voice. They can scream louder than anybody else. And they get paid to show up. And they're going to mourn. When you can't mourn anymore, they take over. So the house is filled with people. They're weeping. They're wailing. But Jesus says, stop the weeping. Stop crying. She isn't dead. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. You see Jesus' perspective this morning? He did it in John, the 11th chapter, with Lazarus. When, when they get the word that, that Lazarus is sick, Jesus says, eh, he's just going to sleep. You see, Jesus' understanding of death is something that we need to have in our lives right now when we're facing the death of our own self, the death of a loved one. We need to understand Jesus saying, you know what? Death is simply a sleep for you to wake up in the arms of Jesus Christ. That's the hope of eternal salvation. That's my plea to for those of us that are lost, that have never called upon him this morning, is that we give our lives to Jesus Christ because his perspective is eternal. This is not the best place, but his perspective is eternal. She's only sleeping. Then we see his power. To finish up, we see his power and we see his priority. But the crowd laughed at him. <laughs> they laughed at him. My friends, I, I know, we, we, I want to encourage you. I know in your desperation. But I want you to put your faith in Jesus. And I know that you may have family members that are going to laugh. The world's going to laugh because we have the perspective that this is not it. All we're trying to do in this world, all the money we're trying to make, all the power and prestige that we're trying to get in our lives, this is not, this is not it. His perspective is eternal. His perspective is what I am building, what I'm making, what heaven is going to be like for those of us that put our faith and that we trust in the most hopeless situations and we are filled with fear. But we know in the middle of our fear that Jesus Christ is here and he cares. The crowds laughed at him. Because they knew she had died. They knew there was no pulse. They had checked and checked and checked, and now Jairus was there. So then Jesus walks in, only mom and dad, only the disciples there, and he sticks out his hand. He grabs her voice in a loud voice. I said, probably for everybody else to hear. My child, get up. And, you know, somebody in the other room had to go, gosh, man, he is killing me. And at that moment, at that moment, when Jesus touched her at that moment, when the woman touched him at that moment, she stood up. She stood up. You see, my friends, you and I may feel, be filled with desperation today, but there is hope in the touch of Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of baptism in Romans, the sixth chapter, that when we are buried in that water grave, we touch the death of Jesus and his blood. And we rise up out of that immediately to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, to be filled and clothed with Jesus Christ. Immediately. Immediately. She stood up. I said his priority here. He tells mom and dad, don't go tell anybody. Don't go tell anybody. You know why? You don't have to. You don't have to go tell anybody. You see, this woman was going to have to tell somebody because she was alive. She's going to have to go back to the priest. She's going to have to go back and do all these things to be able to prove. So Jesus right there says, tell me your story. Everybody hear her story. She's healed. But now, he says, you don't have to tell the story. You know why? Because you're going to take your daughter. I want you to go in the other room, and I want you to get her something to eat. Get her something to eat. Show the world who I am. My friends, we need to go out into the world as desperate as we are, because if we're desperate, if we're feeling this morning, we're filled with fear, that world out there, driving by this church, the people out there, 
they are filled with far more desperation and they're looking, they're hoping for something. They're hoping for the right president. They're hoping for the right vaccine. They're hoping for the right job. They're hoping for the right spouse. They're hoping for, you know, the right money, the right education. We can list long list of things that the world is looking for. And Jesus says, I want you to go show them. Go show them what I've done in your life. Go show them that you're desperate too. Go show them that I can touch your life. You see, my friends, Jesus is the only hope for this world. Jesus is the only hope for our lives of desperation and fear. Jesus is the only hope. And this morning, maybe you've been beaten down and I understand your fear. And so I ask this morning, if you need prayer, when we sing here in a moment, you go to the back of the room. There are people waiting to pray for you. People that in their lives, they would say the same thing. They would go, we've been desperate. We've been hurt. We've been filled with fear. But we just want to pray over you. If you have never called upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning as we sing, you come right up here. We have people waiting to baptize you, people to explain to you, to take you, disciple you afterwards. But don't put off. Don't wait. Don't let the crowd stop you. Don't let the wailing of the world stop you. Look and see Jesus. He's all. He's the only hope we have as we stand and we sing this morning together.